Good evening. I'm John Rosenberg, Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor at La Trobe University, and uh, I bring greetings from our Vice-Chancellor, Professor John Dewar, who's actually at a University Council meeting this evening, uh, which of course is rather important for those who work in universities, and so was unable to join us. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. Thank them for their care of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone here to, uh, this evening to tonight's Bernard Balin Lecture. A and I'm honoured to welcome in particular our special guest, Professor Tony Badger from Cambridge University, who's kindly agreed to give this year's lecture. Since 1995, the, ba the Bernard Balin Lecture has been presented by La Trobe to mark the university's expertise in North American studies and to provide an opportunity for a distinguished scholar in a relevant discipline to visit La Trobe University. The lecture is named after the first speaker, Professor Bernard Balin, whose distinguished award-winning work is centred on early American history and the American Revolution. The Bernard Balin Lecture is also recognition of La Trobe's acknowledged strength in history, particularly American history. La Trobe chose to specialise in American history early in its existence partly to break away from the traditional focus on British and Commonwealth history, which was prevalent amongst other institutions. And for those not so familiar with La Trobe, La Trobe in its early days was a rather radical institution. And in fact, we're trying to make La Trobe again a little more radical. We think that can only help. We're very proud of the success and recognition we've received to date. And we'd like to share with you that in 2012, the excellence in research in Australia, the so-called ERA results, which compared all universities in Australia, uh, La Trobe received a top result of five in, his, uh, in historical studies, the only non-group of eight university to do so, which is a wonderful outcome. I'd also like to mention the dedicated work of the late professors Rhys Isaac and John Salmon. John Salmon only passed away earlier this year. And Prof Professor Isaac won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for History in 1983, being one of the, the uh, highest honours ever awarded to a La Trobe scholar. Both Professor Isaac and Professor Salmon uh, played an important role in establishing the Balin Lecture and kept it going throughout the years, so they're sadly missed. So I hope you will enjoy this evening's uh, lecture by Professor Tony Badger. Thank you for your attendance. I'm sure it will be a wonderful lecture, and we look forward to seeing you at other La Trobe events. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening. I'm Timothy Minchin, uh, Professor of North American History here at La Trobe, and welcome to the Bernard Balin Lecture in North American Studies. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Tony Badger. Tony has been the Paul Mellon Professor of American History at Cambridge University since 1992 and Master of Clare College in Cambridge since 2003. Professor Badger grew up in Bristol and completed his undergraduate education at Cambridge, going on to receive a PhD in American history at Hull University. From 1971 to 1991, he taught American history at Newcastle University in the UK. Tony's scholarly work has focused consistently on American history since 1930, particularly the history of the New Deal and the history of the American South. He has written two case studies of the New Deal, Prosperity Road, the New Deal Tobacco in North Carolina, which was published in 1980, and North Carolina and the New Deal, published in 1981. He has also published an influential general history of the New Deal, entitled The New Deal, The Depression Years, which was published in 1990, and this book has been used widely in American history courses around the world. In his 2008 study, entitled FDR, The First 100 Days, Tony returned to the subject of the New Deal, in November 2008, then British Prime Minister Gordon Brown selected this book as his book of the year, recommending it as, quote, a classic example of how much a work of history can illuminate the issues we're dealing with. In addition to the New Deal, Tony has written extensively about Southern liberal politicians, in particular how they handled the issue of race. A collection of essays on this theme was published in 2007 under the title New Deal, New South, the Anthony J. Badger Reader. In a similar vein, Tony is currently completing a biography of former Tennessee Senator Albert Gore, Sr. 
Tony holds an honorary doctorate from Hull University and is a fellow of the Society of American Historians. In 2009, he was appointed chair of the Kennedy Memorial Trust, which administers the memorial at Runny Mead in Surrey to the late president and gives graduate scholarships from the UK to attend Harvard University and MIT. In 2011, he was appointed independent reviewer for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to oversee the release of papers in the controversial migrated colonial archive whose existence was revealed in a court case brought by victims of torture during the Mau Mau emergency in Kenya. As Paul Mellon, professor of American history at Cambridge for over 20 years, Tony has also done a great deal to develop the subject of American history, both at Cambridge and also in the UK and Europe as a whole. He has organized scores of seminars and conferences that have consistently brought high quality speakers to Cambridge from around the world. Tony has also supervised a large number of PhD students, and many of them, including me, have gone on to hold academic posts in American history. Tony has always been committed to developing interest in American history outside of the United States, and it is in this vein that he has generously agreed to travel to Australia and talk to us tonight on the subject in Depression and War, Australia and the United States, 1929 to 1945. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Tony Badger. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's a daunting privilege to give a lecture that honors Professor Balin, who was a towering figure in American history and who was also one of the electors who appointed me to the Paul Mellon Chair in 1992. Uh, it's a very pleasant duty as well to acknowledge Tim, because Tim was the first of my PhD students. Uh, and he was the one who made me thinking, think that supervising PhD students was a really easy business. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. He devoured the sources. He obtained the first academic job he applied for and published more than I have done in the intervening years. If all my 35 PhD students since 1992 had been as successful as Tim, my life would have been a lot easier. I also take great satisfaction in Tim's progress in Australia, where he has joined, as John pointed out, a remarkably distinguished group of Americanists. Australian historians of the United States have met the acid test of any Americanist based outside the United States. That is, they publish with the best American presses in the best journals, and contribute centrally to the uh, main issues in the American historiography. And as, as John pointed out, it's a matter of great sadness that one of the most distinguished of those historians, and an old friend of mine, John Salmon, uh, should have died recently. It's a rash historian who embarks on a lecture on comparative history. And the origins of this lecture can be traced back last year to a visit that Ruth and I made to the Sydney Museum of History where I read of the Japanese submarine destruction of the Catapult in 1942, and then learned of the loss of life when the Japanese bombed Darwin. What struck me was this loss of life on the Australian mainland. By contrast, I knew that only six Americans were killed by enemy action in the mainland United States in the course of World War II. Japanese bombers could not reach the continental United States, but they sent 9,000 balloons packed with explosive across the Pacific, using the jet stream in the hope of wreaking havoc in the western United States. On May the 5th, 1945, a pregnant woman, Elsie Mitchell, and her five children were killed when, looking for a picnic spot, they discovered a balloon bomb that had landed in the remote forest of southern Oregon and then exploded. After the uh, Sydney Museum, I also saw exhibitions on World War II in New York and St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh, sorry. And this uh, may not come out quite so well, but uh, this is actually from the St. Petersburg Museum in Florida. This man is your friend. He fights for freedom. And just in case you don't know that he's an Australian, it's pointed out to you. Um, what was striking about these exhibitions were the same themes about the sacrifice on the home front, about rationing, about women in the workforce, about overcrowded housing, and hopes for the post-war world. Posters called for a war on waste, pushed the sale of war bonds, encouraged women to take the jobs of the boys who were away at the front, 
and demanded that all avoid careless talk which might cost lives. Their styles and iconography were the same in the United Kingdom, in Australia, and in the US. As for the Depression, American historians, as I shall show, are increasingly comparing the New Deal with the record of governments in other countries, in Europe and in Australia. One of the most distinguished historians of the 1920s and 30s wrote, the Depression therefore marked a watershed in the course of social reform, a graphic demonstration of the inadequacy of the old world words and the need for new. In the United States, the worst depression in American history reduced GDP by 35% between 1929 and 1933. Unemployment rose to probably 30%, and that's probably an underestimate of the industrial workforce. Agriculture was devastated by overproduction, drought, and the burden of debt. Banks collapsed right through the 1920s, but during the 1933, so many failed that when Roosevelt took office in 1933, the whole financial system had ground to a halt. There were none of the safety nets that exist today, uh, relief for unemployment insurance or bank guarantees of bank deposits or farm price supports. The response of Roosevelt's New Deal represented the big bang of the federal government. Uh, it attempted to micromanage the economy, it refinanced home and farm mortgages, guaranteed farm bank deposits, regulated the financial markets, protected trade unions, and in the Social Security Act of 1935, established America's first effort at a welfare state, uh, ending its role, its isolation in the Western world as a sort of welfare laggard or outlier. The political result was dramatically to boost progressive politics in the United States. The New Deal created a class-based coalition of industrial workers, African Americans, and immigrant voters that made the Democratic Party the national majority party in the United States for the next generation. So there was little doubt, as that historian commented, that the Depression marked a watershed in the course for social reform in the United States. But the quote about the graphic demonstration of the inadequacies of the old ways and the need for new was not about the United States. It was the words, the words of the great Australian historian Stuart McIntyre in his, his Oxford History of Australia, and it's about Australia. Whereas Hoover and the Republicans in the United States bore the brunt of the political fallout from the Depression, in Australia, as in Britain, it was the left-wing Labour Party that faced the consequences of the dramatic collapse in wool and wheat prices and the growing difficulty of meeting the repayments on the excessive Australian borrowing of the 1920s. As unemployment rose to 29% by 1935, by, sorry, by 1931, one of the highest in the developed world, the Labour Party was severely restricted in its policy options. The Commonwealth Bank under Sir Robert Gibson and British creditors, represented by Sir Otto Nyemeyer from the Bank of England, demanded an austerity regime as a preconditioning for, condition for lessening the interest payments and to enable future borrowing. An overvalued currency hampered an export-led economy. But devaluation was initially ruled out by the bankers who were fearful of impression, inflation. Under the Premier's plan, Labour government, James Scullin's government, had to accept a 20% cut in government expenditure, while the arbitration court imposed a savage cut, wage cut on American workers. Some, notably Jack Lang, the Premier of New South Wales, favoured a repudiation of debts in order to fund public works. They were expelled from the Labour Party. Ted Theodore, as Treasurer, favoured a modest expansionary public works programme. But the Senate defeated his plans, and Joseph Lyons, the former Premier of Tasmania and acting Treasurer in the Scullin government, led five colleagues over to the opposition benches in protest at the unwillingness of the government to uh, pursue an austerity package. In December 31, Scullin and the exhausted faction-ridden Labour Party had to go to the country. Joe Lyons and a coalition of the newly formed United Australia Party and the Country Party came into power, imposed the austerity package, and were rewarded by the rescheduling of loans by the British creditors and the availability of funds for some public works projects. Devaluation, 
the revival of world wool prices, the protection of wheat exports under the 1932 Ottawa Agreement, and the protection afforded by a tariff to new industries like the chemical and electrical goods industries in, the, in Australia led to recovery of the Australian economy, which was well on its way by 1934, and unemployment had dramatically fallen by 1935. Conservatives would dominate Australian politics until 1941. The, two, the different uh, political consequences then of the Depression shouldn't nevertheless mask the similarities in experience. Uh, similarities on the land where people fa faced uh, losing their farms to foreclosure. Um, there's, in, in, in both Australia and uh, the United States, there are plenty of incidents of farmers holding what in the United States were called penny auctions in which they surrounded a farm that was on sale uh, when one of their neighbors had to put up their farm because it was being foreclosed uh, and basically prevented anybody offering more than a penny for, those, uh, for that farm. Transients around the countries, country riding the rails, searching for work, and they were a feature in both countries as were shanty towns for the unemployed known as Hoovervilles in the United States or encampments like the one here on Dudley Flats in Melbourne. In both countries, the provision of unemployment relief rapidly exhausted private and charity resources, and the main burden in both countries fell on the state and local governments. In neither country, with the exception of unemployment insurance in Queensland, was there a systematic welfare system. At the state and local level, relief took the form of sustenance payments, SUSOs here, mainly made available in food orders. What was different in the United States was the New Deal response to the exhaustion of that provision. Uh, the, new, the federal government in the United States funded unemployment relief by the states, but it concentrated its resources on government jobs programs that employed as many as 3.5 million workers. What the New Deal aimed to do was to provide jobs that were like real jobs. They wanted a job rather than a dole for the unemployment. While the New Deal never spent enough money to really achieve that goal, it came much closer than the occasional piecemeal provision of relief work in Australia. In the long term, of course, Roosevelt introduced a Social Security Act. By contrast, the Lyons government had to withdraw its national insurance bill in 1938. In both countries, communism prospered in the 1930s. It was the heyday of American communism with perhaps 100,000 members of the party in the 1930s but probably twice as many as that actually made their way through the party in the 30s. And it was true in both in Australia and the United States. Being a member of the Communist Party was a very disciplined and tiring business. As Ralph Gibson in Australia said, only the strongest stayed in the party. One party member recalled in Australia that at a meeting, a party cadre speaker would give a political report that took you from the Arctic to the Antarctic. This survey of world affairs was thorough. We'd start at 7 o'clock at night, and at 9 o'clock, we were only down to the equator on the way down. He despaired as how to make that relevant to the rank and file of party members. Uh, it's true that the Australian party was a lot more blind in its devotions to Moscow. It was a lot more prone to incessant purges and what Stuart McIntyre describes as an orgy of self-criticism. It was more that way inclined than, uh, than, the American, uh, than the American Party. The American Party was therefore better able to deal with the switch to a popular front tactic by Moscow in the late 1930s. It took the Second World War and the Soviet contribution to victory to enable the Australian Party to reach its peak of membership of 20,000 members in 1945. What is also stri striking, it seems to me, is the scale of anti-communism in 1930s Australia. It is a staple of the historiography of American McCarthyism that McCarthyism was not an aberration, was, but was part of a long history of American anti-communism. But the 1930s was not one of those peaks of anti-communist agitation in the United States. But in Australia, the persecution of communists, censorship of their publications, prosecution for use of the mails, the breaking up of meetings of both police and vigilante groups, deportations, at both the federal and state level, under the guidance of leaders like John Latham and Bob Menzies. That was more like the 1919 Red Scare in the United States 
or the later McCarthyist purges uh, after World War II. Nothing like that was taking place in Australia, in America in the 1930s. I should also note that in America, uh, the, the New Deal produced a remarkable cohort of network of college-educated women at high levels of government who had far more influence in the American government uh, in the 1930s than would be the, true again in America until the 1970s. They acted very much as a network under the tutelage of both Eleanor Roosevelt and Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins. They were influential because their social work and social welfare expertise was needed in New Deal agencies. There's simply no equivalent in Australia. Uh, in Australia in 1939, there was a, a, an announcement of a New Deal for Aboriginals. Um, but that New Deal was introducing a program of assimilation for Aboriginals. At the same time, John Collier's New Deal for Native Americans uh, in the United States was taking the reverse stand. It was abandoning assimilation and it was attempting to preserve traditional um, religion, traditional culture, traditional education, and to grant a measure of grassroots democracy to the Native Americans themselves. Now, in this comparative context, economic historians have focused on why it took America so long to get out of the Depression compared to European countries and compared to Australia. According to this interpretation, the New Deal delayed recovery, a recovery that would have come from going off the gold standard uh, and, um, in 1933, delayed that recovery because its labor and industrial policies raised business costs and discouraged private investment. As a result, higher wages prevented a normal recovery. The New Deal actually prolonged the depression by creating an extraordinarily high degree of regime uncertainty in the mind of investors. For commentators today on the right, most notably Amity Schley's uh, in the United States, the 1930s constituted the big bang of the federal government when America took the decisive wrong turn in its modern history. In this interpretation, Andrew Mellon and Calvin Coolidge and Amity Schles has just done a biography of Calvin Coolidge, um, these were the heroes. And Hoover and Roosevelt were villains for interfering with the market. It's both an economic case and a passionate moral critique of the New Deal for bribing the electorate, promoting class warfare, and creating a self-perpetuating and anti-business uh, bureaucracy. The Australian response to the Depression, devaluation and austerity, is now celebrated by right-wing commentators and historians in the United States as the road America ought to have taken in the 1930s. Schles, who is now a fellow of the Bush Institute, argues in the contemporary debate over economic policy in the United States, argues against economists like Paul Krugman and Joe Stieglitz who call for economic stimulus. She argues that austerity works and she points to Australia in the 1930s as her prime example. She cites Anne Henderson's recent biography of Joseph Lyons to argue that Australia recovered, quote, far faster than the United States. In turn, Henderson cites Schles's work as a key part of her re rehabilitation of Joseph Lyons as an excellent economic manager. While America, according to Henderson, flirted with a command economy, Henderson concludes that, quote, what has been forgotten and never spoken of, that both Australia and the UK handled the Great Depression far better with conservative economic management than the United States' New Deal of government spending. Well, it surely justified to rehabilitate Joseph Lyons from the rather dismissive comments of historians that he sort of stumbled through the decade and that he was neither innovative nor assertive. He shared a number of characteristics with Roosevelt, with whom he got on very well when he went to the White House in 1935. He won three successive federal elections. Like Roosevelt and like Stanley Baldwin in Britain, he was one of the first politicians to master the use of radio. Like Roosevelt, he was willing to fly around the country campaigning, 
where Roosevelt somehow kept together a coalition of Southern Conservatives and Northern Liberals, so Lyons was the glue which kept an un inherently unstable coalition of the United Australia Party and the Country Party together. Party managers begged him, even when he was clearly suffering from ill health, begged him to stay on as Prime Minister because they rightly feared that the brilliant but aloof Bob, Bob Menzies would make a divisive and unpopular leader. Finally, according to Andrew Ross, like Roosevelt, for all the ambiguities of his foreign policy stance towards the European dictators, Joseph Lyons uh, presided, presided over a staggering increase in defense spending. But it's one thing to rehabilitate Lyons, it's quite another to argue that the Australian austerity road was the road that the American uh, uh, pr progressives should have taken in the 1930s. The right argues that R Roosevelt should have done nothing after reopening the banks and going off the gold standard. The argument assumes that the government had bottomed out, the depression had bottomed out in 1933. The best economic and econometric analysis that we now have of the 1930s um, by a, an economist from the New York Fed who was a former PhD student of Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, that analysis shows that without the New Deal action, there would have been a further 30% decline in GDP on top of the 35% that had already declined between 1929 and 33. This analysis points out that in the first four news years of the New Deal, GDP rose 33%. It only fell back when Roosevelt cut spending, but then increased another 49% between 1939 and 42. Recovery, according to this interpretation, came not from defense spending, which is what critics of the Roosevelt administration always say was the only reason the American economy recovered, but from Roosevelt's decision to resume government spending in 1938. The New Deal is, is criticized for the length of time to recap it took to recapture 1929 levels of GDP, but the New Deal had to confront a financial meltdown in 1933 when Australia was already on the road to recovery. The right comparison is in assessing the New Deal is with 1933, not with 1929. An export-driven economy like the Australian economy benefited from devaluation in ways that the United States could not. The rise in world wool prices, which essentially pulled Australia out of the Depression, could not significantly benefit the United States. It's also slightly strange for advocates of the contemporary free market to celebrate Australia's achievement when their wheat exports recovered under the preferential treatment of the Ottawa Agreement and their new industries developed under the wall of a protective tariff. The final misleading comparison is the apparently high figure for American unemployment. This masks the three and a half million workers on government jobs programs who were counted amongst the unemployed. So I think it's difficult to disagree with Australian economist Colin Clark's assessment of the Commonwealth policy in the 1930s. One can understand their predicament, but it is hard to condone their scale of values. Almost any alternative measure would have been preferable to leaving hundreds of thousands of men unemployed for 10 years. The Premier's plan and austerity prolonged the Depression and made unemployment very much worse than it would otherwise have been. So while we have this revisionist interpretation of the austerity program in Australia vis-a-vis -vis the New Deal, we also have a revisionist interpretation of the actual impact of the Depression most notably summed up in David Potts's book, The Myth of the Great Depression in Australia. He argues from a remarkable series of oral history interviews. Thus it was during the Depression in Australia, no one died of starvation due to po poverty, malnutrition declined, infant mortality and general death rates fell, health improved, and the great majority remained housed much as usual and were adequately clothed. Potts laments that left-wing historians who, put, put, who uh, uh, parade a tired and poorly thought-out materialism have failed to have emphasized resistance at the expense of resilience. And he points out that his oral history interviews show that many people, 
uh, were happy in the 1930s. Uh, that uh, the 1930s were years in which they experienced community solidarity. They were involved in self-help strategies to cope with unemployment. They were involved in strategies involving the strong family to cope with the effects of unemployment. And uh, they, they, kept, they kept happy and busy uh, in leisure sports uh, like, uh, the, like cricket or watching Fala uh, win the Melbourne Cup. I think that Potts is setting up a straw man. It's entirely possible. And when you read the people that he's criticizing, uh, historians like Wendy Lewinstein acknowledge that things like the suicide rate fell in the United States during the, in, the, in, America, in Australia during the 1930s. Um, but they, they, and they also celebrate resilience. What they're disagreeing on is actually the, the scale of the deprivation and depression that uh, Australian uh, unemployment victims suffer from. And when I look at the picture in the United States, it's entirely possible to see all the strategies that Potts outlines for Australian workers and unemployed happening in the United States. And again, you don't, you, one celebrates the resilience and stoicism of the American un unemployed, but that's not to deny their bitterness uh, at what was happening to them. So many of the strategies that uh, Potts celebrate, uh, I'm very sceptical of the argument that hardship rather than affluence, produces greater personal satisfaction. Uh, in the United States, there's a historian called Pete Daniel who writes about agriculture, and he condemns government programs for helping farmers leave the land in the 1930s. He said that barter and self-help, rather than commercial agriculture and migration to cities, was a reasonable alternative. After all, says Daniel, the human race has often found grim satisfaction in living as close to the margin of absolute failure as possible. I am as skeptical of that comment as I am of Potts justifying talking about the myth of the Great Depression. It is at least common for humans, perhaps as an evolutionary impulse, to choose to make their own lives difficult or challenging. World War II transformed the global position of the United States. In 1938, the United States Army consisted of fewer than 140,000 men. The United States had no troops stationed outside its borders. Yet in 1945, the United States was a superpower whose military might matched its economic might. It produced half the world's manufacturing output and had the largest army and navy in the world and troops stationed on every continent. The scale of the task of making that change and preparing Americans' defenses was enormous. In 1939, the American army ranked 17th in the world. Um, a, an inspection tour by Congress of American Defense Facilities was slightly alarmed to see that the most effective defense uh, arrangements came in, uh, in El Paso, where they saw 5,000 men and 5,000 horses uh, all perfectly trained for parade purposes. It was difficult to believe that within five years, the United States would be producing 60% of Allied munitions and 40% of the world's arms. In 1939, defense spending was a mere 1% of GMP. By 1944, it was 44%. To keep a soldier in combat for a month needed a ton of ammunition, food, clothing, and medical equipment and the United States put 13 million men into uniform, men and women, and 220,000 of them were based in Australia. The New Dealers hoped that the war would reinvigorate the liberal cause. Mobilization and the necessary state controls to ration scarce raw materials and to prioritize their allocation would, thought the liberals, lead to a more interventionist role in the economy industrial councils at the workplace, the provision of low-cost housing for defence workers, reforms to enable women to work, help to enable small farmers to produce more food. And New Deal relief agencies, they thought, would be transformed into training and educational vehicles for the new industrial workers and for the military. And at the end of the war, New Dealers anticipated that they would significantly extend the welfare state 
to reward the population for its participation in the war effort. To avert the expected post-war depression, uh, the New Dealers expected revived government spending and jobs programs. Well, it didn't work out like that. Uh, economists sometimes talk of the wartime economy as a command economy, but command was a wishful dream, not the reality. Voluntarism remained the order of the day uh, in the United States. Mouth-watering incentives were offered to industry to convert to war production in the form of tax write-offs, government guaranteed profits, and government finance plant construction. Large-scale business restored its prestige. The mutual alliance between consumers and labor, which existed in the 1930s, was, was replaced by what turned out to be a, a largely permanent split between middle-class consumers in the United States and organized labor, which consumers blamed for raising prices. After the war, pent-up consumer demand, rather than government spending, ensure that there was no post-war depression. Instead, conservatives in Congress aimed to eliminate any spending not directly related to the war effort. They abolished New Deal agencies. They restricted the rights of unions to strike. They watered down the efforts of the administration to pay for the war with progressive taxation. When the government came up with a GI Bill, a remarkably generous bill to provide educational, health, and housing benefits to returning veterans, a bill which produced enormous, enormous social change in America in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, the Liberals wanted to extend these benefits to all people in America, to all, who had, people who, by definition, had mainly participated in the war effort but had not actually served in the armed services. Uh, and they failed. The Conservatives were unwilling to make that sort of extension. In Australia, by contrast, the war provided a tremendous boost to progressive politics under the Labour, Labour government of John Curtin in 1941. The Australians operated on something much more akin to a command economy than the Americans. Curtin was able to exploit the direct threat to the homeland to impose on civilians what Kate Derrien Smith describes as, quote, the most comprehensive set of government controls over consumerism, employment, leisure, travel, housing, and access to information ever experienced before or since. Curtin knew from intelligence sources by March 1942 that the Japanese did not plan to invade Australia. But he saw no reason to hurry to share that information with the rest of the population. The continued threat of the Japanese invasion facilitated popular acceptance of controls and support of the war effort. The Labour government in Australia in many ways achieved during the war what the New Deal had achieved in the United States in the 1930s. The Labour government made significant extensions of the welfare state, including child endowment programs, unemployment insurance, and improved pensions. The Treasury managed the economies in ways that had been largely the province of private bankers in the 1930s. The government introduced more redistributive taxation the Labour Party matched the constitutional revolution that the, United, that the New Deal had instigated in the 1930s, a revolution consolidated by Roosevelt's appointees to the Supreme Court. The big bang of the American federal government in the 30s was matched in the war by the Commonwealth takeover of social welfare and taxation powers from the states in Australia. In both the United States and Australia, women were drawn into the workforce and into the armed services. In both countries, they, like Rosie the Riveter, moved into male jobs in heavy industry, although women overwhelmingly actually moved into clerical and service jobs. In both countries, the propaganda emphasized that these were temporary moves to support the men at the front. The assumption was that women would return to the home after the war. Many did but a significant number remained in the workforce after the war in both countries. The female participation in the workforce had indeed permanently increased. Nevertheless, the ideology of separate spheres, of a domestic proper role for women, was powerful in both, the, both Australia and the United States. The Australian government did far more to provide government childcare facilities than the Americans but they did not become a permanent part of the welfare state. Neither country introduced equal pay for women. In neither country 
did women's economic gains during the war produce a women's movement for uh, equal rights for women? By contrast, in America, economic gains for African Americans when they moved into the defense industry jobs in the northern cities and served in the armed forces. These gains were the precondition for a civil rights movement. African Americans fought a double V campaign, seeking victory over fascism abroad and at home. As they migrated northwards, so their political leverage increased. In the army, albeit a segregated army, they were taught, as black militant Robert Williams remembered, how to shoot. Veterans returned to the southern United States, determined to create a new world there. Part of the stimulus to rising black expectations was service overseas. African Americans, despite their segregated menial and service jobs, found service in Europe liberating and eye-opening. It's not clear that they experienced the same liberation in Australia. The Australian government did not want them there and insisted that recreation and mobility was severely restricted and that fraternization with locals was strictly discouraged. On a lesser level, the manpower shortages that opened up military opportunities for some 3,000 uh, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders and a measure of greater employment opportunity did have a role in developing long-term agitation for indigenous rights, but it scarcely created an Australian civil rights movement. The war showed a famous and decisive shift of, American, uh, of Australian dependence for its defense and foreign policy from Britain to the United States. As you know, John Curtin famously wrote in December 26, 1941, Without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it clear that Australia looks to America free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. We know the problems that the United Kingdom faces. We know the dangers of dispersal of strength. But we know, too, that America could go, Australia can go on and Brit Britain can still hold on. We are therefore determined that Amer Australia shall not go and we shall exert all our energies towards the shaping of a plan with the United States as its keystone, which will give to our country some confidence of being able to hold out against the tide of battle swings against the enemy. Australians were angry at the British for the pointless sacrifice of Australian lives in Greece and in Crete for the unwillingness to retrieve and to relieve the siege of Tobruk, and the appalling contemptuous attitude of British generals towards Australian troops, vividly described by Michael McKernan. But of course, anger at the British was dramatically increased by the fall of Singapore and the surrender of 15,000 Australians into the Japanese hands. The defence of the Australian homeland had depended on the British Navy and the Great Base in Singapore. Even though the British knew that they could not fight a two-ocean war, they had made assurances to the Australians that were at best disingenuous and certainly too readily believed by Robert Menzies and his colleagues. The fall of Singapore exposed the futility of the reliance on Britain. As David Day described it, the great betrayal. Manning Clark, the great future historian and public intellectual in Australia, drafted a letter to the London New Statesman, which he didn't send in the end. He said to English readers, perhaps if you recall what you felt after Dunkirk, you may almost understand how we felt after the fall of Singapore and Java. I say almost because English comments seem to ignore the central fact that Australia may have been the first European country to be occupied by the Japanese. Our fevered minds recalled the pictures of Nanking, Shanghai, and Changsha. No wonder we felt afraid. We were defenseless. Yes, defenseless. We believed that the English would save us. Generations of Australians have grown up with a blind faith in the English fleet 
After the war, Clark became the first historian to teach a full-length course on Australian history in an Australian university. Paul Keating, kissing the monument at Kukoda on Anzac Day 1992, said, this was the place where I believe the depth and soul of the Australian was confirmed. If it was founded in Gallipoli, it was certainly confirmed in the defense of our homeland. The different position of Australia could be summed up by a simple fact. During two great crises, the Depression and the outbreak of war, James Scullin and Robert Menzies could be absent for Australia from Australia for months on end. David Day believed indeed that Menzies even contemplated replacing Churchill as a British Prime Minister. The first Australian ambassador to Washington, Richard Casey, was appointed as the British Minister Resident in the Middle East. Curtin reluctantly visited the UK in 1944, but visiting the United States was at least as important. At the conferences setting up the United Nations, Doc Ever worked to secure the rights of small nations in the New World Organization. But Roosevelt did not expect small nations to shape the post-war world. He anticipated that the great powers, America, Britain, Russia, and China, the four policemen, would guarantee security in their spheres of influence. Where would Australia fit in this new world order? And as early as 1935, John Latham had pointed out that Australia still used the British formulation of the Far East. But he pointed out that what was the Far East in London was the Near East in Australia. And after the war, uh, the Australians became almost as dependent on the Americans as they had been on the British. Writing in the aftermath of the 50th anniversary of the D-Day landings, Tom Brokaw in the United States called the Americans involved in the landings, quote, the greatest generation any society has ever produced. The Americans are not known for humility. They had rendered an extraordinary service, but returned home to lead ordinary lives. And the greatest generation has been celebrated in American history. This generation uh, became the beneficiaries of the GI Bill with the new suburban homeowners in the post-war affluent society, the dominant figures in politics and leaders in their community. This generation fostered the community organizations, the voluntary associations, from parent-teachers association to baseball little leagues to bowling leagues that characterize post-war American society. There was much myth about this picture the number of the 13 million servicemen and women who actually fired a shot in anger during World War II from the United States was very small. And brutality and mayhem were certainly not absent from the American war effort. Alienation, trauma, and disillusionment were still an important part of this greatest generation's post-war experience. But there's clearly less generational impact in, the United States, in Australia. Australian veterans inevitably suffered in comparison with the Anzacs in World War I. The heroism of the Gallipoli story, the sacrifice on the Western Front, and the critical role in the final victorious assault on the Germans. There was a less compelling story to tell in World War II. The terrible experience of 22,000 POWs in the Far East does not convey the same message, no matter how heroic and sacrificial the resilience of the POWs was. The role in Europe inevitably seems marginal. Kokoda saved the mainland, but the later fighting in the mandated territories and in Borneo seemed sometimes unnecessary and certainly did not receive the same coverage in the media in Australia as the war in Europe did. MacArthur deliberately kept Australian troops out of the assault of Japan in 1944 and 1945. There is little doubt that the experience of those who served overseas and those who were in uniform who were not in uniform, was different. Uh, if you read Malcolm Knox's account of Brad's, Bradman's War, the 1948 tour of England, uh, you'll notice the difference attitude of Miller and Lindwall and Hassett to both authority and to the notion of cricket as a bitter war uh, diverged greatly uh, from Don Bradman's. But it was not until John Gorton and Gough Whitlam that America was led by people who had seen significant service in World War II, and they were followed by post-war politicians who were too, too young to serve in the war. In 1947, 
Republicans gained control of Congress in the United States. In 1949, the new Liberal Party of Robert Menzies ousted Labour in Australia. Both countries embarked on policies which presumed that government could manage economic growth successfully, increase the size of the economic cake, but without continuous state intervention that would have to redistribute the resources of that cake. The controls of World War II were no longer needed. But in both countries, the legacy of war and depression meant that economic security was as important as economic growth and that government had a responsibility for maintaining basic social minima uh, in both countries. In both countries, the federal government in Canberra and Washington was now the government that mattered. But as polls and the voters showed in both countries, in both countries, the values of individual, individualism and self-help were extraordinarily resilient. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tony. It's very, it's very interesting to see two stories that are usually told separately connected up in the way that you did. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. And there are a couple of roving mics that will come over to you. Very much enjoyed the lecture. Um, and I've always uh, found it interesting, the sort of pantomime of today that um, you see from the conservative economic commentators. You know, they you know, dress everybody up in um, the clothes of the 1930s. And you can almost guess which actors are which sometimes. Um, my question is, um, you know, why they have decoupled devaluation from um, stimulus. I mean, presumably, you, you, all of the orthodox uh, economics of, um, even of the period, like with, with Keynes and so forth, um, late, well, slightly later on, was that you would devalue and you would um, have public work. So, I mean, aren't they kind of cheating by deciding that you can't have both of the nice things at once that would fix the economy? And, and if so, how do they get away with that? They get away with it here because the depression in the end wasn't as deep-rooted as it was in the United States. And so the, I think the pressure for public work spending was never going to be as great. Um, re and recovery, devaluation brought recovery quicker than it did in the United States. Um, but it's also true that the, the, the reconversion of loans that they were able to, to uh, bring about because of the austerity package actually gave them um, a reasonable amount of money. Uh, revenue in the 1930s. Um, so uh, the austerity package uh, was in a sense masked by the, um, the bankers in London. Professor, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the influence of Maynard Keynes on this uh, whole era. Uh, Colin Clark, uh, Colin Clark um, was uh, a very close associate of of Keynes, and he was the economist I quoted about uh, about how um, how wrong the policy options had been in Australia in the 1930s. Keynes was very scathing about uh, Australian borrowing in the 1920s, um, but he did believe that. Uh, uh, and and I, I also think that actually the number of economists in in Australia who were really influenced by the by by Keynesianism was relatively small. Um, Institutionally in the United States, there's a sort of, you can see a sort of the New Deal acting as a sort of laboratory for economic learning, which enabled uh, Keynesians to get influence uh, in, in, the, in Washington, in the Treasury, uh, and in the government. Ironically, of course, Roosevelt wasn't a Keynesian. Um, and when they, famously, when they met, neither was very impressed with the other. Uh, and <clears throat> the reason Roosevelt resumed spending in 1938 was not because he was economically convinced of the wisdom of Keynes, but because of the political imperative of doing something as a result of the recession which he caused by cutting government spending. Uh, thanks for that. I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the things that occurs to me about the pressure that was on the Australian governments and the American governments was from, from and, and different, was from the trade unions like the great strikes of the late 20s in response to the start of the Depression. In Australia, the unions were defeated and greatly weakened. 
in the United States, of course, they went on to form the Congress of Industrial Organisations. And I wonder if that doesn't, in fact, help to describe or to explain the way in which the governments reacted, that in Australia they had greater freedom of manoeuvre, whereas uh, Roosevelt was much more constrained about this pressure from below to act in the way he did. I think Roosevelt was very conscious of pressure from below in the sense that uh, he feared for the future of democracy if uh, lower-income Americans, both unemployed and workers, uh, were not given some form of assistance. Uh, but in terms of union growth, uh, the, the chronology is slightly different because, in a sense, um, it's the New Deal which facilitates the translation of rank-and-file militancy into solid union gains. Uh, and so the sit-down strikes of 1937 and 1938, where they really, for the first time, really break into the mass production industries the center American, core American industries, which had traditionally been bastions of the open shop. That, in a sense, is related to the, the, the protection that the Wagner Act gave um, the trade unionists, and in particular, the fact that if they had a premature strike and got defeated, it wasn't the end of the game. Um, so there's a very clear, it seems to me that, it, in a sense, it works the other way around. It's the government and the political changes which give the freedom of maneuver for the unions to make the sorts of gains they make in the, in the 1930s in, in, in the United States. For an outsider to um, the historiography of the New Deal and Depression, it can be easy to uh, just be frustrated by the level of politi politicization. Um, it seems like, it, almost, it, it could almost seem like the scholar's view of the efficacy of the New Deal is predetermined by his or her, her normative view of the proper role of government. I wanted to press you a little bit more on Amity Schley's and this line of argument that strengthening the unions increased unemployment and prolonged the depression. Do we take the right-wing scholarship seriously? Is it serious scholarship or is it ideological distortion? Uh, have I stopped beating my wife? Um, the, the, uh, the, I think it's... When I was a graduate student uh, in the 1960s, I, we, there was a new left interpretation of, uh, very much related to, to radicalism in the 1960s of the New Deal, which suggested the New Deal had missed a great radical opportunity. And that was never really sustained in the historiography uh, over the years. Um, but was very conscious of writing against that when one was trying to write. And, and I think that the academic historians in the United States tend to dismiss Schley's and right-wing critics as being the product of Fox News uh, and the, the chat shows. Um, whereas, in fact, it seems to me to be quite a resilient argument. And it's also linked to, to the argument, the much more technical argument of economic historians about recovery uh, in, in Europe compared to the United States. So I think it, I think it deserves to be taken seriously. I disagree with it, but I think it deserves to be taken seriously. But it's true that some of my academic colleagues in, colleagues in the United States think that it's not even worth engaging with. Thank you, yes, for a very interesting talk. I was interested in your use of David Pott's work on, on the Great Depression, and um, many uh, historians would agree with your interpretation of it. Uh, but one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking was about the significance of the Depression generation in Australia and the way in which that generation and the deprivation of that period and the war period so shaped a whole mentality. And you talked about the kind of the war generation, but I'm wondering, um, did a similar, was there a similar impact in, um, in America in terms of the way in which that sense of what it means to go through something like that collectively and to survive, to come through, shapes a whole way of thinking about the polity, if you like. I mean, the, the longitudinal analyses of American families um, that we've got from some of the social scientists does suggest that there was a heightened sense of that particular generation, it's not just anecdotal, had a heightened sense of the importance of economic security. Um, and it was, as far as we can work out, the 1930s was the only decade in modern America when social mobility actually declined. Uh, and so they had good reason to be, to be fearful about security and, and invest a lot in that in the post-war world. Um, and until the 1960s, 
um, and 19, to really until the start of the 1970s, most Americans believed that their children would be better off than they were, which they had not necessarily believed in the 1930s. And it is that generation that's very conscious of that. That all gets you know, thrown into the, um, thrown up in the air in the, in the 70s, uh, with the end of that period, a particular period of economic growth. So I, I, I do think it, it's important, and, it, and it's, of course it's classically being used to describe the difference between uh, young people in the 1960s and their parents. But their parents were, uh, because of the depression, were so concerned about economic security and they, the young people in the 1960s were free, uh, freer of that constraint and therefore could have free, be free to be more radical and less concerned about pressing economic issues. Okay, well, I, I think our time is up and I um, just wanted to thank you all for, for coming to the lecture tonight and to, to thank Tony for such a wide-ranging and stimulating lecture. Thank you. Thank you.